Perfect. Uh, so we're live on YouTube now. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to today's lecture. As you can see, we're going to be talking about the dermatology exam. Um, and we're really lucky to have uh, Dr. Banerjee join us today and teach, um, to teach all of us about this dermatology exam. Um, so Anisha, if you wouldn't mind just moving on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, dermatology exam once again, and Dr. Anisha Banerjee will be our lecturer today. Um, just a little bit about um, Anisha. So she's just a recent graduate of um, King's College London, um, and she will be starting uh, in the next couple of hours, really, um, working as a doctor in, in, the, south, in the south of England. Um, and yeah, we're really, really uh, glad that she's been able to give up some of her precious free time um, to teach us about this exam. Uh, this is a specialty she's very interested in um, and would like to pursue in the future as well. So um, yeah, we're really, really happy to have um, Dr. Banerjee on board today. So thank you for joining us, um, Anisha. If you wouldn't mind, could you just move on to the next slide? Oh, yeah. Before, <laughs> um, before that, I would just like to say one thing. Um, there is a series giveaway, uh, as many of you are quite aware of now. Um, and it's really simple to uh, get involved. Uh, at the end of this lecture, I will, or you will, you will scan the QR code to fill the feedback in. And when you fill the feedback form in, you will have a uh, automatic certificate which will be generated um, and that you can use for your personal CV portfolios, etc. cetera. Um, but that certificate is also a receipt of um, being included into our series giveaway. Uh, which includes lots of presents um, from our sponsors below. Um, so that's QuezMed, MySuture, Os Implants, and Podcases by Scrubbed In as well. So please stay till the end. Um, I will release the, the feedback form link alongside the QR code on, on YouTube and Zoom in this meeting as well. So, so yeah, um, with that, um, Anisha, I'd like to, give you, uh, like to give you the floor and thank you for talking for us again. Oh, no worries, that was a really nice introduction, thanks. <laughs> okay, so here's a little context of what we'll be going through today. So we've got introduction to the skin, so I'm just going to give a little intro into what the skin's about, because I feel like we never really get much teaching on the skin, and we kind of forget why it's important. Um, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the skin, uh, and then I'll run you through a quick dermatological history examination, and most importantly, how to communicate findings from your dermatological examination, because I think that's the most difficult part. There's so much different literature and new terminology it's a real barrier into getting into dermatology um, and then we're going to go through a couple of cases and a little quiz on how to describe some common diseases so a little intro into the skin so the basic functions of the skin are providing sensation there's a barrier and immune function and most importantly you've got some protection from your melanosomes um, and I think the beauty of dermatology is that most diseases of the internal organs, you know, from thyroid, from the liver, inflammatory bowel disease, everything has a manifestation in the skin. So it's always relevant, no matter what speciality you're doing, you're going to find skin symptoms. And your skin thickness varies based on the anatomical location you're looking at on a patient and the age and the sex of the patient as well. So the epidermis tends to be thickest on your palm and soles and thinnest on the eyelids and the skin behind the ear. Um, and then you've got the dermis, which is thickest on your back. And then obviously subcutaneous tissue is thickest areas where you have the most fat. So you've got abdomen and your butt. Um, typically male skin is thicker than the female skin and that's everywhere. And the typical progression of skin thickness, it's the thinnest in children. It then starts thickening until kind of your middle age, 30s, 40s, and it thins out thereafter as you grow older. Um, quick run through of the anatomy of the skin. Uh, so you have the most superficial layer, which is the epidermis, that's split into four layers, which we'll go through later. You then have your dermoepidermal junction, and that's got the basement membrane. You then have the dermis, which has two layers, the superficial papillary and the deep reticular layer. And then you've got subcutaneous tissue with a variety of different ignexa. And here are the four layers of the epidermis. So you can see 
the deepest layer is the stratum basale, you can see on the diagram. Um, and this has basically stem cells. We've got columnar regenerative cells here. And what they do is they divide, they then flatten out, they lose their nuclei, and then they move up towards the superficial layers of the skin. And that's a process called cornification. Um, and keratins 5 and 14 are expressed in this layer, and that's typically important uh, for a particular disease called epidermolysis bullosa simplex, which is an autoimmune uh, disease, basically resulting in blistering of the skin. Um, so it's a genetic condition, we'll see that in children. Um, yeah, as we said, the basal cell divides and then daughter cells migrate upwards and then replenish that layer. So here's a little picture of epidermolysis bullosis, bullosa. You can see that in a child. It's not a nice disease, and it's basically any trauma or friction which then results in blistering really easily. Obviously, you can see it looks painful. And so that's keratins 4 and 15. Um, and then the next layer is the prickle cell layer or the stratum spinosum. So it's named spinosum because of the spiny appearance of desmosomes, which help the keratinites kind of adhere to each other. And keratins 1 and 10 are typically expressed in this layer. And when these are mutated, you get oh, sorry, well, uh, epidermolytic ichthyosis, which is basically, basically a result again in blistering. And you get kind of dry, thickened fish scale skin. Um, and then, yeah, so you've got desmosomes, which anchor the cells together in this layer. And like we said before, the process of cornification and flattening continues as we move up. Um, this is the ichthyosis, not a very nice disease. Um, and then the next layer is the stratum granulosum. So we've got consists of cornified cell envelopes. We've got lipids which are cross-linked to the proteins and they help mechanical and um, they, they help that mechanical and water barrier, which we do, talked about in the first slide. On H and E staining, this is the darkest layer, and this is because of the keratohyaline and granules. And this is the layer which thickens in scratching and rubbing, particularly the disease, the disease lichen planus. Um, so yeah, so you've got the granules and these granules contain a lipid rich secretion and this is the kind of water sealant layer. And this is the lysyl histology, so you've got stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, as we said that's the kind of darkest purple layer there. Um, this is really interesting, this is the stratum lucidum and this is this layer really thin, you can hardly see it, it's only because the diagram points to it, and that's only found on your palms and your soles. Um, and then the last layer is the stratum corneum. So this is the final layer of keratinized flat cells. And at this point, you call the keratinocytes corneocytes. They've lost all their organelles plus their nuclei and they're dead hard cells, which gives them that barrier function really nicely. And the way you describe that is like a brick, brick and mortar structure. So you've got the corneocytes, which are the kind of the bricks, and they sit in a mixture of lipids and ceramides and particularly in eczema, this is why when you're deficient of ceramides and lipids, that's why you get kind of dry, flaky skin. Uh, it's because the stratum corneum is very deficient in this. And then just back to the histology, so you've got the dermis there, stratum germ germinatum, which is just a different name for stratum basale, spinosum, granulosum, the lucidum, which is very thin, and then you've got the corneum there. Okay, and then there's four major cell types in the epidermis. So you've got keratinocytes, which we've mentioned quite a bit. Um, very present skin, hair, nails. Um, melanocytes, so these are dendritic cells and they make melanosomes, which have that very precious pigment called melanin. And this is quite interesting. So keratinocytes actually phagocyte the melanosomes and that's how you protect the skin from the UV radiation. I actually didn't know that until very recently. Um, and then, oops, and then you've got the Langerhans cells, which are mainly found in the stratum spinosum, and they're antigen presenting cells, and they aid the body to recognize allergens. And then you have Merkel cells, which are there for mechanoreception. So these are the more four major cells that you know about in the epidermis. And then coming onto the dermis, two layers, and typically the way that the epidermis and the dermis are locked, it's not smooth. You have down projections of the epidermis, which are commonly known as reedy ridges. You'll see that in loads of dermatological papers. Um, and then you have the dermo-epidermal junction, which you talked about before. And the two layers of the dermis, so you have the superficial papillary layer. And here you've got a subpapillary plexus. You've got arterioles, venules, nerves. Um, and these are the nerve fibers which are affected by inflammation and leprosy, interestingly. 
Um, and then you have a deeper reticular dermis. So this has its own plexus, but just larger vessels. And the typical cells found in the dermis are kind of fibroblasts, collagen, elastin, ground substance. And you've got collagen one and three, which is actually down-regulated by steroids. So that explains why you have atrophy as a side effect with steroids. Um, and then also helps from protection from UV light. And typically retinoic acid, I don't know if anyone have heard of it, it's very common in dermatology. So this is the kind of area where retinoic acid acts on to have that anti-aging effect. Um, and then you also have elastic fibers, which decrease with aging and defective in Marfan's. And then you've also got ground substance. This is basically just a variety of molecules called glycosaminoglycans. An example of this is a very infamous hyaluronic acid. So you'll see that in loads of cosmetic products. They always say this product is HA, HA, because um, typically, it kind of gives the skin a kind of fuller, youthful looking um, appearance to it. But actually, interestingly, it needs to be down in the dermis, which is why typically those products aren't really going to have much an effect if you're just putting it on topically. Um, not, they don't say that to you in there. But, so that's why it's present in fillers, because when you're injecting it, that it gets down to the dermis where it actually has an effect, as opposed to just using topical treatments. Um, and then you also have a variety of different ad nectar in the dermis. So these are hair follicles, um, sebaceous glands, apocrine glands, erector pili. Um, and that's a kind of quick summary of the skin anatomy. Uh, so let's move on to taking a dermatological history. So uh, with any history, it's pretty much the same kind of structure. You have a presenting complaint, the history of the presenting complaint, and you've got your past medical history, medications and allergies, particularly important in dermatology just because there's so many drug side effects which have skin manifestations. Uh, family history, especially for genetic diseases, we've already discussed so many of them which have problems because of keratins and keratin mutations. Um, and then social history is very important as well. A very good example of this and very current would be there's so much contact dermatitis at the moment just because of the amount of times people are washing their hands and hand sanitizing. And then like every single history, I think patients, so ideas, concerns and expectations, which is particularly important in dermatology. So with a presenting complaint, ask about the nature of the lesion, let the patient describe the lesion to you, it's their version of their symptoms. Um, ask about the site and the duration of the lesion. And then particularly very specific symptoms of dermatology are, is it painful, is it itchy, is it bleeding, or is there any pus associated with it? Um, aggravating and relieving factors. So very interestingly, there's the Koebner phenomenon in psoriasis. So trauma to any normal part of the skin sometimes can produce psoriatic lesions in that area, even though the skin is normal before. So trauma is particularly something that can aggravate lesions. And there's also something called pathogy in pyoderma gangrenosum. Uh, you have triggering factors, the so chemicals, hand wash, like we said, in contact dermatitis, and particularly ask if they've been in contact with anyone recently, particularly important things like scabies, who are they living with? Um, stress, which can aggravate psoriasis and acne, um, and then illness and travel. So the history of the presenting complaint, like we said, ask about the initial appearance and the evolution of the lesion, particularly for kind of skin cancers. Um, ask whether they've tried anything and have they been affected. And really important to ask about history of sunburn and the use of tanning machines. Um, travel kind of fits in there a lot of people who present with skin cancers now typically they've had a phase where they've lived in a very hot country they've lived in australia or they've lived in southern europe and always you don't need to ask about the skin type their skin type will be obvious so we use the Fitzpatrick skin phototype so you can see skin types one to three are the most commonly affected by skin cancer and then it goes down so your risk of skin cancer decreases with these skin types and also really important to ask about if they've had any problems with their nail, scalp hair or other joints. These are kind of secondary dermatological organs. It's really important to ask about those. And if they've had this disease before. Um, okay, so past medical history, ask about any other derm dermatological conditions. What's really important to ask about is the atopic triad. So this is basically eczema, allergic rhinitis and asthma. And anything else as well. So diabetes is a really horrible ulcer called necrobiosis, like poidica, really not a nice disease. Um, and also diabetes can predispose people to bacterial fungal infections, which you can see coming up on the skin. 
Um, ask if there's any past surgical histories, particularly relevant right for skin cancer. Have they had skin cancer excisions before? Um, ask about medications and allergies. So everything, prescription medications, over the counters, any supplementations, and ask when they started it and have they changed their dose as well. And really interesting, a lot of drug eruptions tend to occur at the same time. So from naproxen, it's always the same location every time. So this is why it's really important to get into the details of where it happened and exactly what they took. Um, and then again, family history. Um, a social history is really crucial as well. So smoking, alcohol, recreational drug use. Uh, there was a recent paper I, wrote, uh, I read and it was an really interesting case of kind of cocaine induced vasculitis. So it's really important to ask about recreational drug use and get the details as awkward as it may be. Um, and then occupation, do they have an improvement of a lesion away from work? Like we said, the contact dermatitis, nurses and their hand eczema. Um, you need to ask about that because obviously for a nurse, they can't stop work. So that's obviously a barrier to getting better. So it's really important to get into the details and then you can kind of focus on the patient's lifestyle and try and think of ways to help them because obviously stopping work is not the solution to hand eczema. Um, and then travel. Always ask about how have they traveled recently because obviously there's infections and there's local infections to the areas they've traveled. So like we said, scabies, but also ticks and Lyme disease, really, really common in America, kind of the north central areas. And ask about new pets, new cosmetics, laundry, detergents, and new shoes. Okay, and always eye for psychological impact of the skin. Um, so dermatolog dermatological examination. So there's four principles to a derm examination. So we've got inspect, describe, palpate, and a systemic check. So we start off with an inspection of the skin, just have a look generally, also note the Fitzpatrick phototype, which we talked about before. Look at the number and the location of the lesions. Look at the distribution and configuration of lesions on the body. Um, so if anyone doesn't know what configuration means, the configuration refers to the shape or outline of skin lesions. Um, and then how to describe an individual lesion. So we use something called SCAM. So look at the size, which is the widest diameter. So S for size, S for shape. Then look at the C, C for color. Um, red, purple, yellow, just describe exactly how you're seeing it. Um, and then A is for any associated secondary change, which I'll come on to later. Um, and then we have M, which is for morphology and margin. And then A is for additional assessment for pigmented lesions, which has its own kind of assessment. So describing a lesion, so I mentioned associated secondary change. So there's two types of skin lesions. We've got primary skin lesions, which are absolutely unmodified. Uh, they're direct from a disease or at birth. So this can be directly from infection or an allergic reaction to the environment. And then you have secondary skin lesions, which are evolved from primary, primary lesions. So this can either be from trauma, infection, or medication that you're taking from your primary skin lesion. So it kind of comes along with disease progression. So examples of this is crossing from scratching your eczema, that would be a secondary skin lesion, um, an infection to an allergic wheel, that would also be a secondary, and you know, lichen, lichenification of the epidermis results here as well. So when you scratch and scratch and scratch, the epidermis thickens and roughens. So that's the secondary skin lesion from say a primary eczema that you had. So it's really important to kind of distinguish these two lesions. And then, like I said, the last part of SCAM was looking at pigmented lesion. So you have an A, B, C, D, E approach to these lesions. So you look at A, you look at the asymmetry, or is it, is it symmetrical? So you can see here in the benign area, it's quite symmetrical. If you split it into four, pretty easy to see it's a nice little circle. Whereas here in the malignant melanoma, you've got asymmetrical lesion, no size match. So that's immediately red flag. Um, have a look at the border. So you've got a nice even border here. Absolutely horrible here. That's a pretty good sign that something wrong is going on here. And you've got colors. So two or more colors increases the likelihood that it's going to be a malignant melanoma. Have a look at the diameter, kind of how small it is, less than six millimeters, if you're thinking it's okay. Any larger red flags, alert, alert, could be malignant melanoma. 
um, and then have a look at the evolution of the lesion. So that's why the history is really important. You need to ask the patient what the lesion looked like when it first appeared and asking them the details of how they noticed, whether it's changed in any of these areas. So has it changed? Do, have they noticed the borders have become more even? Have they noticed the color has changed? Um, so you just need to ask the patient. Most people are very aware of the fact that changing moles have significance. So chances are your patient will be able to tell you quite a detailed history. Um, and now let's move on to communicating examination findings. So it's really important to use the correct terminology um, and it's really crucial to communicate with other dermatologists and develop that differential diagnosis, but not only just dermatologists, um, other specialities as well. There's a difference to say, it's really useless saying there's a, there's a rash. A rash could be so much. We could describe most of the diseases we've already covered up until now as a rash. So it's absolutely useless in terms of differentials. So this is why the next part of this presentation is really, really, really important. And it will take a while to get your head around it. So communicating the morphology, which is basically the structure of a lesion. So we've got a difference between primary lesions and secondary lesions. So if we start off with flat lesions, macules are what we call kind of flat lesions less than one centimeter. Uh, so a really good example of this is freckles. You can just call them macules, which I think is quite cool. And then anything above the one centimeter is called a patch. So you've got a nice big patch of vitiligo there. Um, and that's very clearly hypopigmentation. And then any solid raised lesions, which are not fluid filled, we call them papules if they're less than 0.5 centimeters, plaques if they're less than 0.5, over 0.5 centimeters, and you've got a bit of scaling there as well. So you can hear, see here in this psoriatic patient, we've got some scaling here. Um, and nodules, which I have a rounded, more deeper component, and they're over 0.5 centimeters. And a morbilliform rash is kind of a mixture of macules and papules. And if you do see something that's morbilliform, morbilliform, uh, you're kind of thinking this is either going to be a drug eruption or it's going to be an infection from a bug. So uh, clear raised fluid filled lesions, fluid -filled lesions. Um, anything less than 0.5 centimeters, we call these vesicles. And anything other, anything bigger than 0.5 centimeters, we call this a bulla. So you can see there's bulla here, and then these are much more smaller. So you've got all vesicles all around here. Um, and then there's also special skin, special skin tests for blistering lesions. So um, we call it the Nikolsky's test. So on the skin around the bulla, you have if you apply kind of lateral pressure on that the unblistered skin it ends up shearing if you put an eraser on the normal skin it really easily shears so that would be a positive Nikolsky's test um, and this is positive in Stephen Johnson syndrome and pemphigus vulgaris however it's negative in bullis pemphigoid because that has a much more deeper disease process so you're not really going to get shearing on kind of normal tissue around the bullet um, and pemphigus vulgaris basically exhibits acantholysis, which is why you have this test, which ends up being positive. You have a loss of intercellular connections. I remember we talked about the desmosomes in the layers of the epidermis. You lose that cohesion between the keratinocytes. So it really easily shears the epidermis and you get kind of the blistering sign. And then you have the asbo Hansen sign, which is vertical pressure on a bullet causes lateral spread of the lesion. So you get this intoxic epidermal necrolysis. Um, and it's basically the result of extensive keratinocyte death. Um, and we, we talked about the DEJ quite a bit. And that results in dissociation of that layer between the epidermis and the dermis, which is why you have this lateral spread of the lesion. Um, okay, and then moving on. So we've got pustules. So these are small pus containing lesions, similar to these cores, but they've just got pus in them. Uh, then you've got foron cores, which is a fancy term for boils, essentially. And carbon cores is just multiple balls kind of together. And then you've also got wheels, which is a transient raised lesion due to dermal epidema. I'm sure many of you, you have seen wheels before and typically these resolve in 24 hours. So moving on to secondary lesions, um, we've got something called oscoriation. So this is just the loss of epidermis following trauma. So it's quite common in eczema. If patients are scratching their lesions, you can see here, uh, you've got a lot of epidermis there. 
Um, and then you've got a fissure, which is an epidermal crack, often due to dryness. Uh, it's typical on kind of thick, dry skin. So you've got hands, heels, corner of the mouth. And then lichenification, which we've discussed before. Lichenification, you'd describe it as well-defined roughening of the skin. And it basically accentuates skin lines. So you can see in this patient who has eczema, you can see the skin lines are really accentuated here. And you'd call this kind of, this roughening is called lichenification. Um, and then scaling, which I'm sure many of you will have heard, typically so plaques and psoriasis have that flakes of the stratum corneum, that, that top layer of the epidermis starts flaking. Um, and then you also have a thin plaque, which comes in psoriasis versicolor. Uh, and then you have crust. So basically the crust is just a rough surface. I'm sure many of you will recognize this in vitigo. So you can see that golden honeycomb crust there. Um, and it's just made up of dried up serum, blood, bacteria that's exuded through an eroded epidermis. An example of a, just a burst blister, which results in crust. Um, okay, and then, okay, so ulcers are basically excavations which reach the epidermis and the dermis, which is why these heal with scarring. So, talking about scarring, scars. So if scars are basically, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to define a scar, it's just new fibrous tissue, which occurs after healing. Um, so you can get atrophic scars, which is kind of thinning of the skin. Um, and then you have hypertrophic scars. So these basically result in kind of thick scars around where the patient was supposed to heal, but it stays within the boundary. So this is a really nice example. You can see it's very much within the boundary here. Um, but you can see it's still hypertrophic. And then the difference between hypertrophic and keloid or star scars is that keloids go beyond the wound boundary. So they just disrespect this completely. And the, the, you'll see a lot of examples behind someone's ear. So you can see, you don't even see where these lines are anymore. You've just got a massive, massive scar here, and that's a keloid. And um, typically you'd excise those. Um, and then, so the next part of the derm examination is palpation. So you want to palpate the lesion to assess the surface and consistency of lesions. Um, I think this is really important because you need to find out whether it's rough or smooth. And then is it elevated or is it depressed? So I think typically we see a lot of elevated lesions in dermatology. So keratic canthoma, urticaria, everything seems, seems to be elevated, but I think we forget about depressed lesions. So I think hypertrophic scarring acne you can see in this, this patient's back. It's so interesting if you were to feel that you could feel it that indent going in um i just think that's a nice example i don't think we talk about it enough um there's loads of different types of acne scars but i think depressed lesions it's quite a common thing to see and it's a good example of why you need to palpate and and, like, and then again so consistency what is the actual lesion have in it is it hard is it soft so that soft pus versus a hard keratin inside the lesion. So nice examples of these are, so you've got these tiny dots, which are called milia. I don't know if you've many, I don't know if anyone's heard of that before. So milia is a kind of very, very small cyst and they contain keratin in them. Um, and they're harmless. You'll see them in children. They've just got, they're just tiny white pearly bumps. Um, and then, but then I think it's really important to differentiate the contents of lesions because you've got molluscum contagiosum here. So these are kind of small round papules. Um, and here they're kind of pinkish and they have a kind of like waxy kind of shiny look to them. But typically they contain kind of pus material in them. So I think it's easy to confuse things, but it's really important to kind of understand what is actually inside the lesion because it helps with the differential. And then this is what you call a cutaneous horn. I just think it's a really cool lesion. Um, so it's actually completely made of keratin. Um, it is a conical projection of keratin and it can be benign, but it's also pre-malignant as well. And I think it can be malignant as well. Um, but I just think it's cool. It just kind of says why you need to know what's inside and why palpation is really important. Because how a lesion feels can help you diagnose something. Um, and then also, is the structure mobile? Does it move on its own or is it linked to other structures? And again, just for infective reasons, is it tender? What's the temperature like? Um, can help you tell whether the lesion is inflamed or not. Okay, and then last but not least, so 
systemic examination I've brought this up so many times where there's so many different diseases which have skin manifestations it's really important just to double check with the patient what else is going on so we've talked about secondary skin areas which are kind of the scalp hair nails so just have a quick check of those have a look um, and then also examine any other suspected symptoms so for example if you if someone is coming in with kind of thyroid symptoms as well have a quick thyroid do a quick thyroid examination so there's a, a nice kind of picture of kind of uh, myxedema which you get in hypothyroidism um, and then so we mentioned kind of secondary skin areas so i'm just going to run through a couple of uh, diseases to look out for so you've got alopecia which is a loss of hair so it's an autoimmune condition so check if there's a history of this disease in the family um, and then so you've got alopecia areata which is kind of well-defined patches of hair loss which surround the normal hair so you can see you can see very well the well-defined patches and then you've also got alopecia totalis which is the loss of all hair from the scalp um, and then nails, I think, are really, really important. So I think in all examinations from cardio, rest, abnormal, we always, always check nails. Same with dermatology. Dermatology does involve nail disease as well. So it's very, very relevant to being a dermatologist. So some symptoms to look out for with pitting. So you can see that here. If you've got these kind of punctate depressions on the nail plate, and it's typically associated with psoriasis, can be associated with eczema as well, and alopecia areata, which we just went through. And um, you've also got onchalysis, which is the separation of the nail from the nail bed itself. You can see that here. And again, you see that in psoriasis. You get so many nail symptoms in psoriasis, definitely important to check. And you can also see it in some infected diseases, trauma, and actually, interestingly, chemotherapy as well can result in onchalysis. Colonicia, I'm sure we've all heard of colonicia. You get the classic spoon shaped nails in iron deficiency anemia. I think that's a really nice image. And then clubbing, we all, all know about clubbing, so it's a classic sign. See in COPD, lung cancer, interstitial lung disease, IBD and Graves. Um, and then it's just interestingly as well, um, of note, I think we've talked about kind of the hair and the scalp. I think it's really important as well to check the ears. So typically actinic keratosis, which is a kind of pre-malignant lesion, you'll typically, you'll find it in, on the ears as well because it's a sun exposed area so typically when it's not completely obvious that a lot of dermatologists kind of feel patients ears because a lot of the time you can feel it before you actually see it which is why palpation is really important as well so moving on so we've covered quite a few terms of how to communicate exam findings i just want to go through it's kind of mnemonic which i think is really really helpful so if you are in the unfortunate situation where someone is trying to get you to describe a lesion. I will just quickly run through this and it will help you have a systematic way of describing a lesion without just saying, ah, oh, it was a red rash. Um, so uh, all of these won't be relevant for every lesion, but just consider it when we go on to describe some cases. So um, L is the location, very, very explanatory, just the area on the body. Um, is it localized? Is the lesion on an area which is sun exposed? So I just mentioned the ears. Um, it'd be really very relevant to say, okay, this lesion was sun exposed, it was on the helices of the ears. Is it symmetrical? Um, is it lateralized or is it dermatomal? And then E is for erythema. Is there redness in and around the lesion? I feel like a lot of lesions do have erythema, so it's probably always going to be relevant that one. And then S, the surface of the lesion. So you already should have palpated the lesion. You should have had a good look at whether it looks rough, does it feel rough? So you should really be able to know whether the surface of the lesion smooth, rough, rough, crusted, scaly, etc., etc. Um, and then T is the type of lesion, which I would argue is the most important. So is it primary or secondary? And C is for color, so it was pigmented, was all hyperpigmented. We found, we looked at a patch of hyperpigmentation in vitiligo earlier in the presentation. And then A is basically arrangement or configuration. So configuration is just how the lesions are arranged in relation to one another. Um, so they can be grouped, they can be generalized, they can be unilateral, dermatomal, or in a ring shape, annular, um, or just linear. Um, and then B is for borders. So have a look at the border. How is it well demarcated or not? Is it circular? Is it oval? Or is it lots of different circles joining together, which is called polycyclic? Uh, sorry. And then S 
eventually is for special sites. So we've just covered why we need to look at the special sites. So nails, scalp, ears, hands, genitalia, obviously with patient's permission, and then also the mucous membranes. So this is what we call secondary dermatology. Um, okay, so communicating distribution. So we've just been through, kind of generalized would be all over the body um, and widespread, really extensive. Localized would be restricted to one area of the skin. And then really important, so flexual is kind of the body folds. So you've got the neck, the popliteal and antecubital fossa and the groin. And then extensile refers to the knees, elbows, shins, typically psoriasis is kind of an extensile disease, whereas eczema is more flexual. Um, and then always check pressure areas, sacrum, buttocks, ankles, heels, and dermatomal, which is basically refers to a lesion, which would be supplied by a single spinal nerve. And then photosensitive. So lesions which are photosensitive are basically either exacerbated or kind of present because they're on a sun exposed area. So these areas are the face, ears, and the scalp. And then communicating configuration. So discrete is what we call individual separated lesions. Confluent lesions merge together. Linear is in one line. Target lesions are concentric rings. So really, really typical in erythema multiform. If you see erythema multiform in a question table, anything you're thinking target lesions, which are concentric rings. Um, annular is like a circle, so ringworm. Always is the coin shaped or, or round lesion. And then color, so erythema we've been through, which is redness, which blanches on pressure. Purpura, however, is a red or purple color, which doesn't blanch on pressure. And the hypopigmentation, you've got areas of paler skin. Depigmentation is just the absolute absence of melanin. So not even just paler, just white skin, absent of melanin. Um, so typically though, we've already been through kind of the different cells of the skin earlier. So you can have kind of work out the pathology of how that works. And then hyperpigmentation is areas of darker skin. So particularly relevant in acne and kind of acne scarring, patients are left with areas of hyperpigmentation. Um, and then last but not least, vascular lesions. So I'm sure we've all heard of telangiectasis. cases. So these are small, superficial, discrete blood vessels, which blanch with pressure. Um, and they're very visible in, on a dermatoscope. And then if you blanch them out on a, on a glass slide, it's called diascopy. And I'm assuming everyone knows what a dermatoscope is. So if you, if you don't, it's basically just kind of a massive magnifying glass, which dermatologists use um, to kind of look at the skin and look at lesions in a lot more detail. Um, it's really, really handy called pad tool, I think. Um, and then it lets you look at the details of skin structures and patterns, which you wouldn't get usually just looking at the skin. Um, but that's a very specialist uh, tool to use. So you have to kind of go in courses and stuff to learn about that. And um, I don't know, I can't use a dermatoscope. Um, but yeah. And then a couple more vascular lesions is Pateki. So these extravasated red blood cells, it's influenced by gravity. So it's a platelet disorder, if you see this, rather than kind of affecting coagulation pathways. Um, and then the larger version of this is just called purpura. That's it's as simple as that. Um, and typically, if you find that the purpura is palpable, so when you've done your examination, it's probably going to be inflammation and edema within the lesion. And then ecchymosis is a fancy name for a bruise. So sometimes obviously you'll get bruise, which looks like a papara, but then the yellow color of a healing bruise, which you eventually get. And that's just the breakdown of hemoglobin into bilirubin. So again, important to note the color of a lesion. Okay, so we've been through a quick stop tour of how to communicate lesions. Um, and we're gonna quickly do a nice little description quiz on some cases. So just put in the chat box what you're thinking. Um, and then if, if someone could tell me what, I don't think I can see the chat box. Um, but any, if you just tell me what people are saying, that'd be useful. Um, okay, so case one. What are people thinking? How would you describe this lesion? Anyone enhance this? <laughs> okay, so if we look at the location of the lesion, um, 
it's facial. You've got a large erythematous patch here and it's well demarcated. So for this lesion, that's pretty much it. So you've got the location already. Um, we've talked about erythema. Um, the surface is smooth, but again, I don't think it's particularly relevant here. So like I said, you don't always have to comment on everything. Um, the type of lesion, this would be a primary lesion. And then the color we've talked about, so it's red. Um, borders we've talked about, so it's well demarcated. And well, I can only show you the face, so we're not going to talk about special sites. So it's as easy as that. Does anyone have an idea of what this case would be or any differential diagnoses? Lupus erythematous? Uh, decent. It does look like that because of the butterfly rash. Um, it's actually erythropolis. So erythropolis is basically a spreading bacterial infection of the skin. So it's particularly caused by strep pyogenes and staph aureus, and it's basically kind of the superficial skin which gets infected. And you'll get signs of inflammation with that. So you'll get a patient which is systemically unwell, got fever, malaise, rigors, um, and it's distinguished from cellulitis by a well-defined red raised border, which is why noting kind of the border of a lesion is really, really important because otherwise you'll get things confused. Obviously, erysipelas and cellulitis will present similarly in terms of systemic symptoms, but the way you can differentiate it is by commenting on that well demarcated border. So here you can see really nicely, whereas in cellulitis, it's more diffuse. Um, you know, it's not well defined. Um, and then, yeah. Okay, case two. So, any, any words people want to describe the lesions with? You don't have to follow the left T-cabs thing I said, just any words that you've learned today uh, will help you describe these lesions other than red flaky rash. <laughs> so remember to comment on location, erythema, surface, type of lesion, the color, the arrangement of the lesions, and the borders, and any special sites, which I've put one here. So you can definitely comment on that. Okay, does anyone want to say what disease it is? Psoriasis? Yeah, psoriasis, yeah. So if we look at, say, this picture, so let's go. So we've got well demarcated lesions. So here you can see very, very, very defined borders. Even here, very defined border there. So if you comment on the border, well demarcated. Um, it's eryth sorry, uh, erythematous plaques. You can see there's redness. And you've got plaque, you've got a silvery scale on the sacrum and the flexural areas of the neck. And here you've got a lovely case of onchylitis here. And it's a lot better than saying red flaky rash. Um, so don't get overwhelmed by trying to put things in a particular order. I think as long as you say something in any order you want, it's a bit more defined than just saying a red rash. Immediately when you're saying silvery scale on the sacrum and flexural areas of the neck, or an erythematous silvery plaque on the sacrum or a well-defined um, erythematous plaque on the sacrum, that's immediately a lot more helpful than saying red rash. So any other terms you've learned today, just try and kind of add them into descriptions you give because obviously it's gonna be difficult to try and put everything together and try and get a perfect accurate description of something. But just saying anything will, will help other than red rash and commenting on other sites as well, that will help with the differential diagnosis as well. Um, so that is psoriasis. It's a chronic relapsing condition um, and it typically affects females more than males. And like we said, it often it affects the extensor. So I mentioned before, I know we said it is a sexual region, um, but typically eczema affects sexual areas and psoriasis affects extensor regions. Um, and then triggers that kind of can cause the rise of smoking, medica medication, infection, trauma, and stress. So in terms of trauma, we talked about the Kovner phenomenon. And then really, really interesting test, I think, with the is the outfit sign. 
So if you scratch and kind of gently remove the scales, it causes this three bleeding. So that's a test to um, and we've mentioned the COVID phenomenon. So you can see this is a completely normal area of skin this patient had. And obviously a bit of trauma, or it looks like a bandage, um, has resulted in a kind of psoriasis lesion there. I think that's quite cool. Obviously not for the patient, but in terms of an academic point of view. Um, and then to treat psoriasis, you have a stepwise approach to treatment. So you've got start with topical therapies for kind of mild disease. So you've got coal tar, steroids, vitamin D analogs, salicylic acid and calcineurin inhibitors or a combination of these. And then you have phototherapy and oral therapies for extensive disease. And then case three, okay. I think this is pretty obvious and we've talked about it before. Um, so it should be quite easy to describe actually. macular like lesions all along the arms yeah yeah there are some macules in there so macules are less than 0.5 millimeters and then if you want to comment on the location yeah you comment on the location do you want to comment on the color um arithmetic yeah arithmetic and then um, on the extensors yeah and then what type of lesion would you say that is Uh, primary? Yeah, primary. And then the bits that are missing are the arrangement of the lesions or the configuration. So kind of what do the lesions look like? How are they related to each other? And then don't forget the borders. So we then describe this case. So it's widespread in terms of distrib distribution. Erythematous, very obviously red. Very sharply demarcated. So you can see the borders very, very clearly. And these are target lesions. You can see a kind of all of these target lesions here. Um, and it's erythema multiform. So you can see really obviously you've got target lesions in the hand here and all over the arms here. So a bit about erythema multiform. It's a self limiting cytotoxic dermatitis. It's most commonly due to drugs and infections. It's more common in males. Um, and the causes of erythema multiform, so infections. So herpes simplex is a really big cause. So one is more common than two. Mycoplasma, um, varicella zoster, adenovirus, viral hepatitis, CMV, and some vaccines as well. And we've got an erythema multiform. But most commonly, so drugs. Uh, NSAIDs, barbiturates, penicillins, sulfonamines, nitrofurantoin, and phenothiazines, which is why taking a drug history is really important for dermatological patients because there's just so many drug reactions which result in skin manifestations. So, yeah, that is the end of the presentation. Do you have any questions? Thank you so much. Um, Anisha, uh, I really, really enjoyed that. I uh, definitely need to refresh my dermatology skills now as well. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, please, please feel free to use the chat function or, or speak out if you can. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Banerjee would, would love to uh, answer some questions. I actually have a question for you. How, how, how do you practice describing your lesions? Do you prefer looking at textbooks or do you prefer going to see patients on the ward and then presenting your findings to, to consultants or, or registrars? So I think having a basic knowledge is really important, obviously reading. So I think, to be honest, I've been through everything I think anyone would need to know describing a lesion. Um, just knowing those terms and being familiar with them and then going and practicing on actual patients. And it's always nice to hear a consultant or a trainee use the terms as opposed to just reading it in a textbook. And also, mm -hmm. like I said, it's not necessary that you have to have things in a certain order. So I know I gave a mnemonic, um, but you don't need to describe a lesion in that order. Not everyone uses the same order. I think it's nicer to hear it from consultants and kind of develop 
your own way of describing a lesion on the go as opposed to reading it in a textbook and trying to copy what they're saying. Um, whereas obviously, you know, in a textbook, someone sat there and pulled it out. Whereas on the job, you're just saying what you see. Mm. It's more important to practice that way, I think. I, I second that because I, I know when I was studying it, learning the lingo for dermatology is quite difficult. And I think as a student, we kind of build up a, a kind of like a blockade that it's really difficult to describe lesions. Yeah, and you don't need to know everything as well. Not everyone is, you're not, a, you're not a trainee at a junior doctor or medical student level. I think if you just know some basic terms, it's immediately better than just saying a rash. Um, so hopefully anyway. everyone, hopefully everyone who's uh, been listening so far can actually describe things better than a rash. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just, if, if you wouldn't mind just moving on to the next slide. Um, actually, there is one question. Um, so a student is asking, uh, can, can you specifically say why you chose dermatology out of all the specialties and what you find exciting about it? Um, ooh, okay, uh, so I've, I've said it a lot in the presentation. I really like how you have different manifestations of the skin in every single speciality. I think it just it makes the speciality very interesting you're not kind of, I don't feel like you're limited to one organ. You're always thinking about different organs and different parts of the body because they end up showing up on the skin. I think that's a really interesting part of dermatology. You're always considering what else is going on in a patient because it's never just, oh, there's a problem with the skin. Um, and another reason I really like dermatology is I didn't get to touch on it much in the history, but there's always a very big psychological aspect of why patients have diseases. So I've mentioned that stress really really plays a part in psoriasis and just lesions in general and kind of acne and everything um and i think it's really 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 interesting how both how your the psychology of a patient impacts that but also the other way skin diseases have such a huge impact on the way people perceive themselves um and it can really really get patients down there's a lot of literature which links skin diseases with psychological and, psych and depression and just anxiety. Understandably, it's horrible to have these diseases. You have to live with them every day. Um, and I think it's quite, it's lovely. I love I really want to be down touch just because I'd like to help people and kind of deal with how to cope with the new way they perceive themselves with all these new lesions. Um, so I think that's really interesting at down as well, just considering that aspect. And obviously everyone is different and everyone finds different things interesting. Um, and I also think it's relevant for most diseases, with not just dermatology, any patient you have, no patient wants to be in hospital, wants to be coming to see their GP, it's going to impact their mental health in some way. So I think it's always, always, always important to consider how that disease or lesion is impacting their patient's life, not just for dermatology. Um, I don't think it's emphasised enough in med school. Okay. Does that answer the question? Oh, another reason is that there's, you don't have to just do medical dermatology, you can do surgical dermatology as well. Yeah, lots of reasons. There's a big scope in dermatology, I think, in general. It's not just dealing with acne all the time, as most people. Yeah, I mean, there's, all, there's also that. There's also the kind of. Yeah, I mean, even acne, acne is one of the, the biggest diseases which results in people becoming depressed and upset with themselves. So. Even though it's really common, it's still really important. <laughs> yeah, I completely understand. Um, there's another question um, from the same student, actually. Um, and obviously, in, in your presentation, you used a lot of photos of people with li lighter skin tones. Um, yeah. Do you think that there's a need for a broader understanding um, of darker skin colors in terms of research and teaching? Um, and yeah, definitely. So, definitely. So, yeah, always. Yeah. Um, we, or, there's a lot of stuff going on. I think in the last year or two, there's a lot of different campaigns to get more kind of coloured skin in dermatological teaching materials. Um, so I think that's on the way. And there's loads of different resources online as well. I think there's Mind the Gap, which is a really nice PDF booklet of all the different conditions, but they, it's only for people with kind of the doctor Fitzpatrick prototype, which is really interesting. Um, and I didn't mention, but a lot of the lesions can look a bit different in colored skin. 
Um, and unfortunately, we don't get taught about that much, but I think that will change over the next few years. But it'll, like anything, it will be a slow progress of, of education. Um, and I will try and include more people ethnic skin next time. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so yeah, I think if there are any more questions on, on Zoom, please, please use the chat box if there are any on YouTube as well. Uh, there's none on YouTube, but for anyone on Zoom, uh, if you'd like to answer a question or ask ask a question rather, um, now's the time. Yeah, we've got a few thank yous for you. Um, I'll just be really, really quick. So um, as many of you know, this is our penultimate talk. Um, and next week on Tuesday, we have our very, very final talk of the entire series. Um, and as you can see, it's going to be on the emergency medicine exam. Um, so anyone studying um, kind of acute medicine or a &E medicine or critical medicine, um, I'd encourage you all to turn up for, for, for next week's event. Um, I think it's going to be another great event, like every single lecture this series. Um, so if you could all save the date, uh, it'll be next Tuesday on the 27th at um, 7 o'clock Central European time and obviously 6 o'clock um, British summer time. Um, so yeah, hopefully many of you on this call can join us then as well. Um, I'm just going to release the, the feedback form link into this chat now and also the YouTube chat, um, but you can also use the QR code, um, should take you there. I can't encourage you anymore um, to please fill out the feedback form because you stand a great chance of winning um, a really nice gift from our, our series giveaway and also um, it's incredibly, I think it's a nice gesture for uh, for any student to give um, Dr. Banerjee as well for giving up her free time to teach. Um, and also as an organization, we really, really value feedback um, so that we know where we can improve and you know what sort of things students would like in, in future talks as well. So um, yeah, please fill out the feedback form. Uh, thank you so much, um, Anisha, for, for teaching us or uh, for, for talking about the, the dermatology exam today. Um, Thanks for having me. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, hope everyone found it useful. Thank you everyone for, for coming and um, I hope to see you guys next Tuesday. Um, and yeah, thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.